Hello and welcome to another Mass Medic webinar. My name is Nicole Owens. I'm the Director of Marketing Communications for Mass Medic. I am pleased to welcome you today to a great webinar we have uh, sponsored by Goodwin on uh, IP pit pitfalls in MedTech M&A transactions. Before we turn it over to Goodwin, just want to give you a few housekeeping notes. We are going to be taking questions throughout the conversation, so please go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen, and we'll take those as they are relevant. This webinar is also being recorded, so everyone who registered for the webinar will receive it um, after it is finished, along with the slides. With that, I am happy to turn the conversation over to Goodwin, and thank you very much. Enjoy. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, thanks for joining today. We should have uh, a fun topic, uh, IP pitfalls in MedTech M&A transactions. You'll note that MedTech is in parentheses because although the issues that we'll touch on are frequently seen in MedTech deals, they're not exclusively seen in those deals. Uh, also, uh, my co-panelists and I have uh, individually and collectively more years experience than we care to admit in uh, doing med tech transactions. So most of our perspectives and, and comments will be, will be focused accordingly. So why don't, why don't we just start with some really brief intros. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Todd, do you wanna start us off and introduce yourself? Sure, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Todd Massell. Uh, I'm currently in-house uh, counsel at Boston Scientific. Um, to Scott's point, I won't tell you exactly how many years, but uh, it's been more than 25 years at Boston Scientific. And for those of you that don't know, Boston is a, a pretty large medical device company um, selling product throughout the world. Um, the company has grown um, in a number of different ways, but one of them is through acquisitions. And over the um, last 25 years, we've done billions of dollars of acquisitions. Um, as a med, de med device company, um, you know, those products are usually protected by patents, so uh, IP is always an important part of every due diligence. And um, as those of you who've been through this know before, you usually do a few uh, due diligence before you actually close a transaction. So, you know, I, I don't know, I was kind of thinking about it, um, but I think I've done hundreds of uh, due diligences uh, over the years. Laura, you wanna introduce yourself next? Good afternoon or morning, wherever you're uh, joining from. My name is Lori Burlingame. Um, I'm a corporate partner at Goodwin Proctor in the Life Sciences Practice Group. So I represent companies across the life science spectrum, including med tech in formation, financings, um, both public and private, um, also in collaborations, licenses, and acquisitions. And so I think as Todd mentioned, med tech being extremely IP and patent heavy, dependent on those for you know getting value mainly into the company later on when you sell products um, and being protected by IP, um, we often see that this is one of the key areas of focus and due diligence and oftentimes where you might see a deal die because something is identified in IP. So uh, looking forward to discussing some specifics on this with you today. Thanks, Scott. Yep, thank you. And, and my name is Scott Looney. I'm an IP partner at Goodwin Proctor in the life science group. I've been working primarily in the med tech space for the last 25 years or so. Uh, I started my career as a patent examiner and then uh, went to a, to a law firm. I've been a partner at a number of law firms. Uh, and I was also in-house at Boston Scientific for eight years or so, which is how I know Todd. Uh, so uh, with that, why don't we... Why don't we kick off? Can we have the next slide, please? So just a note about, give a sense of an overview. What are we trying to accomplish in this webinar? Um, real simple, right? So we're gonna describe some common IP issues and M&A transactions, especially those that we do see in med tech, uh, and hopefully provide some practical examples and recommendations on how to avoid and address those pitfalls. Um, a couple of disclaimers. You know, to keep in mind, so this is obviously not intended to be an exclusive list of IP issues uh, that we see. Uh, it's not obviously not intended to be a comprehensive guide for conducting M and A diligence. We could spend, you know, maybe a week uh, if that was the, the the scope of the of the webinar. 
And also what we, we've tried to be even handed a bit about uh, the approach here. Um, it's not specific to buy side or sell side. Uh, you know, Todd being in-house at, at Boston Scientific for so long, I think he's been primarily, almost exclusively, but not totally exclusively. Not on totally the exclusively, that's right. Yeah, almost, almost. Um, and, uh, but, you know, Lori and I have been on both sides of that equation uh, many times. So we're able to provide you with, with some examples uh, and recommendations uh, on either side. Next slide, please. All right, so starting with the big topic of ownership. Todd, do you wanna kick us off? Sure, all right. So um, obviously uh, central to the transaction is ownership of the IP. And I, I think that probably goes without saying, but uh, as you're looking at IP, um, it's really important for you to identify what's core uh, to the transaction and which IP is core to the transaction. So there can be, depending on the size of the companies that are, um, being transacted, um, quite a bit of IP. And often, uh, and I, in my experience, usually the, the deal is driven by a particular product or product line or, or set of product lines. And so uh, in order to get your arms around um, what uh, needs to be done in the due diligence, I think it's really important that you understand what the core intellectual property is that's related to the transaction. And that um, kind of comes out in a couple of different ways. You know, which are the core patents? Maybe which are the core trademarks? Um, what are the core products? You know, you th need to think about what, what's driving the transactions. Where, where are the markets that those products going to be sold? What's driving those transactions? And you know, really, what do you expect from the IP that's going to come from those as well? Is this a situation where um, the buyer is looking to be able to exclude others from that market, or they're uh, frankly don't need the IP to continue to do that, do what they're going to plan to do? And how does that uh, set up the deal model? So. For me, um, I think it's really important upfront as you understanding what is your understanding what is core to the transaction that you discuss with the key people in the deal, whether it be the the buyer or the seller. Frankly, probably both um, to understand exactly what um, is core to that transaction, which which products, which fields. Um, and then how does that play, frankly, into the deal? You know, are we looking at basically driving the valuation off of the sales of a certain product or sales in a particular market? And that will really set the stage, I think, for uh, focused due diligence where you can focus your resources um, on the important part of the, um, of the transaction. In addition to doing that, um, and one of the things that we've really seen um, can trip people up is intercompany agreements, uh, particularly in, in medical device. Um, it is you know, a, a very common business model where a company will take a core technology and then apply that to various different fields. Um, and of course, it's easy to write these um, license agreements, uh, maybe even set up a second company that's meant to commercialize a particular license or field. Um, but when you think about that as a particularly applied to medical device, it becomes a little bit of a problem because, or it could be a problem because of course the doctors, uh, once a device is approved, can use that device for anything they like. So in an example where we've, I've seen before, where you have a product that was uh, um, created in a sub-license to a particular company for a particular medical device field, which uh, we were very interested in the field, but then once we acquired it, of course, you start to sell and you don't really know what the doctors might be using it for. Or even worse, and I've seen this, where you build the deal model around the idea that it would be used not only in that core field where it's approved for, but also in other fields. And so you expect to get um, sales from other fields. And as we drifted to far, farther and farther from that core field, we started to see that there really wasn't actually a license to operate in those fields. And um, what was really important about that particular transaction was that we would feed that back to the folks that were 
creating the deal model and say, well, okay, if you need to have exclusivity in these other fields, if you need to have the right to sell in these other fields, then we're going to have to bring this in from all these parent companies. If on the other hand, you don't plan on selling into those fields, you don't plan on marketing in those fields, then, uh, you know, then we'll deal with this in a different way. But um, these intercompany agreements, which are a lot of fun, I think, for patent lawyers and MBAs, um, can be a problem really when it comes down to, to selling. All right, and then the last bit is documented ownership, uh, frankly, from the, the seller to the buyer. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of times when this has actually been harder than you think. I mean, you'd think you just check the assignment at the PTO and, and if it's assigned, then we're in good shape. But uh, often we'll find that um, many of these companies start very small. Um, you know, I know they're working really hard to get resources wherever they can. And so friends and family and, um, not paying their lawyers perhaps as much as they should right up front. Um, all of those things have made for uh, some inconsistent documentation relative to the ownership. So, uh, and probably the worst example, we had uh, a company that we were looking at acquiring that actually had its intellectual property sprinkled amongst three different companies. And I don't think they really knew that that was the case. They didn't certainly intend to be the case. So it started as XYZ company, um, a Minnesota company, and then it later became XYZ company, a Delaware company. Um, and then finally, people started just calling it XYZ, um, LLC, I think it was. Um, and that was kind of spread throughout the document. So some of the assignment documents to the inventors said one company, some said to the other company, some of the documents that recorded in the patent office were a different company. And um, yeah, it was work to, to bring them all back together. And I think the biggest risk is, uh, you know, if you have a, an inventor or somebody who didn't actually need to convey it to that company that you're then acquiring it from, you really run the risk of not being able to acquire the, the IP that you think you are. So just, you know, watch those details really, really carefully. Of course, the, the um, PTO and their assignment records are a great place to, to start, but make sure you watch that very closely. Um, and then as a, you know, we've, we've, the bullet here, we've talked about the, um, make sure that the assignment agreements from the inventors, uh, you know, are to the right entity. And if not, of course, you need to, to clean that up. Todd, one, one thing to just add or point out on that, the point you made about uh, the different corporate entities that, uh, that, and I think you alluded to this, it, it may seem like a fairly easy fix, right? You just assign from one company to a single company. Uh, but there may, if those companies are all still existing, there are, are, you know, all sorts of implications around taxes and and other aspects that are very complicated and are, um, you know, they're not not the sort of thing you want to be doing in the middle of a transaction, right? So if you're on the sell side, you want to make sure that it's all cleaned up before you uh, think about doing a transaction. Yeah, I would I would add to that. I mean, that that's in the best case, you know, it's that you've got the sort of traditional taxes and other things to do. But in the worst case, you have different principles in the different entities who um, perhaps will have to renegotiate their deals. And so that can really be a problem. All right. Uh, unless there's questions, I think with that, we would go to the next slide. OK, great. And before delving into this, just to mention for anyone who may have joined late, uh, if anyone has questions throughout uh, this webinar, you can. Uh, there should be a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, uh, we will see the questions pop up and we will try to answer them uh, as, as they come across. Okay, so next we, we kind of turn to the topic of what we're calling inventor entanglements, uh, right? And that comes in a number of different flavors, the first of which is what we're calling employee inventors. Right, and, and th this is related to the issue of ownership. And this specific issue is whether the employee inventor had the right to assign to the employer assignee. And that may seem like a pretty simple question. Uh, usually the answer to that question is yes, uh, but sometimes it's a maybe, and sometimes it's a no. Um, and uh, you obviously would start with uh, the employment agreement that exists between the employee inventor and the employer. Um, and, uh, you know, either by operation of law or through such an employment agreement, the employee should have the obligation to assign his or her uh, rights to any intellectual property to their employer. 
Um, and certainly be prior to a transaction, any, any companies on the sell side should make sure they have uh, agreements in place for all of their inventor employees uh, that have robust um, assignment obligations. But oftentimes that doesn't answer the question, right? Um, if you look at the employment history of some of the inventors or some of the key inventors on the key patents, uh, it might reveal that um, you know, one or more inventors worked at, uh, previously had worked at another company uh, that had uh, overlapping technologies or products or was a competitor in some way. And there is the real question about whether, or there can be a real question about whether there was an obligation to assign the intellectual property rights to the previous employer, right? Um, important to keep in mind that the obligation to assign intellectual property rights arise at the time an invention is made, not at the time it's disclosed to an employer, not at the time an employer decides whether to file a patent application, not at the time of patent filing, not at the time of you know, signing or recording an assignment instrument. It's at the time an invention is made. And oftentimes, if you look at the patent application filing timeline, uh, there may be a flag there. Um, if uh, you know, a key patent was filed. Uh, within a month or two after uh, one of the inventors had joined the company. Um, you know, that is, you know, if you think about the time it takes to invent and then to disclose and then to prepare and file a patent application by in, inside or outside counsel, uh, as many of the folks know on the call today, that's a several, at least a several month process. Uh, so if there is a key patent with uh, kind of new inventors, it, it may be worth on the on the buy side, investigating the employment history of uh, of of any key inventors on those patents. Scott, if I could just yeah. add, you know, from I think it's a pretty common scenario where somebody's sitting at a at, at one company and they have an idea and they say, "Wow, I should have I should take this idea and start a company," right? And so that that overlap that you're talking about, I think, is a very common thing. And, um, you know, did they really have the right to take that idea and start a new company out? It is is a really important question. Yeah, yeah, we've seen that many times. I mean, usually if that happens, or sometimes that happens, uh, you know, it's not done with bad intent or bad faith. It just may be that, you know, as we say on the slide here, the inventor may not have an understanding of their duties. Uh, with respect to the prior employer and uh you know that this is one of those things where intent really doesn't matter right if 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 they had an obligation to assign something to a previous employer that's an issue um and even putting aside the issue of uh assignment obligation to a prior employer there are other things that may come into play um in uh the previous employment agreements such as restrictive covenants around things like confidentiality and non-compete uh, where even even if uh, there is you can't you know there is not uh, an assignment obligation that carries forward for whatever reason, uh, you know the the inventor may be uh, uh, their hands may be tied when it comes to working with the target company in a specific area because of the nature of their work in the prior company, and uh, we've seen that come into play many times as well. So just as a matter of um you know, what to do about it. To me, um, I always think of these sort of like, um, you know, issue spotting law school exams, but you really just got to use your, you know, spider sense and track these things down. So we would always look at see, you know, just basic stuff like, uh, you know, have they, do they have patents at other companies? Are they companies similar? When did they file them? You know, what was the difference between the last filing at the old company and the new filing at the new company? And if you get any sense that there, that just feels like it's too close, then I think you dig in a lot at that point to see what's going on. Absolutely. And on the other side, if you're on the sell side, obviously you want to, you want to anticipate that that's going to be a question uh, and you know, do your own investigation and make sure you have a, an answer that makes sense. Okay, if no other questions or input on this, we can move to the next slide. All right, and I'll take, uh, oh, sorry. Yep. Yep, that's me, okay. Um, so the, um, you know, the another big issue on this, um, 
entanglement question is, you know, does the inventor have the right to assign uh, given employment or consultation with others? So um, the, a big issue that, you know, that I think a lot of people run into in the med device space is frankly, one of our primary customers, if not the most important customers, the doctors or the physicians themselves that use the devices. Um, it is very common that you'll be working with a physician to improve or to find a device for a particular treatment. Um, so that, that happens all the time. It's, it's frankly really, really important to the growth of the business and providing the physicians the best devices that are possible. But those interactions are fraught with, uh, you know, with potential issues of, of ownership by and between the, the companies and the physicians, and then also between the physicians and their hospitals. So, um, and, and it, it, the, the world has really changed. You know, when uh, I started doing work in medical device many years ago, the physicians were kind of, not always, but generally free to, to work on devices on their own and own the, the you know, the rights to those uh, um, ideas and inventions that came out of those. Um, then it was a pretty straightforward discussion between the, the device company and the physician. And if it was really clear what the interaction was about, it would be, you know, it's uh, easy to acquire the, the uh, intellectual property from the physicians. But over the years, the institutions have gotten much more uh, inclusive about it, uh, you know, I'm looking, thinking about Mayo and Cleveland Clinic and some of those other really large institutions that, you know, are known for sort of their creativity. Um, in most cases now they have um, employment agreements with their physicians that really don't allow those physicians to commercialize this on their own and that the intellectual property is probably owned by the by the hospital so um, and this this also applies of course to university professors you know sometimes they're teaching professors sometimes they're just you know technical professors um, but the same sort of issue applies there Does, do those folks really have the right to assign their inventions to um, the company itself and um, we found i know scott you've run into this issue too that the the professors and the doctors don't often even understand their uh, duties in that regard. Um, it seems like something they either didn't pay attention to or the institution didn't tell them or they didn't want to you know, know about it. And so uh, one of the things as we're talking about solutions is many of these big uh, institutions will post their invention policy. So it's actually pretty easy to get a hold of those. So you can do that as a, as a separate matter. And then you know, if, you're, if it looks like it's um, contrary to what you'd hope, then it's something you can investigate. Yeah. So Todd, just a couple of um, kind of maybe uh, recommendations or pointers on this, because as you said, the physician feedback is an important part of the business. Um, and um, if it's possible, what I like to do is uh, go out with a structured kind of feedback uh, framework, you know, rather than just say, you know, throw it out open-ended uh, to a customer or physician, you know, what, what do you think of this product? How would you improve it? You know, what's good, what's bad sort of thing. You know, it's it's sort of it may not may not work in all pur in all, for all purposes, but if you go forth and say, hey, you know, please rate the you know whatever tactile feedback of this or the handle, the ease of use, uh, the GUI, the effectiveness, um, where they're giving more of a uh, an objective evaluation rather than a subjective, um, you know, uh, innovation or or improvement. That I've seen that work in some circumstances. Um, you know, the other thing you could do, obviously, is, and we see this all the time with things like trade shows, if we, you're rolling out a new idea and you're going to be talking to uh, physician customers, you know, uh, to the extent you can do this, you're going to want to brainstorm and file patent applications, uh, you know, before those initial meetings take place. You know, a non-disclosure agreement just isn't going to do it, right? The typical non-disclosure agreement isn't going to do it because it really doesn't speak to IP ownership, uh, the normal non-disclosure agreement form wouldn't speak to, to intellectual property ownership. And frankly, if it does, you know, most physicians might not even sign it. Um, so you're going to want to do that. And or the third thing is, look, if you just can't get around it, and if you do need to, to, uh, uh, to get that kind of open-ended feedback, then you turn to, I know you're going to this now, consultancy, where, you know, perhaps you have sign-off from 
the underlying institution that employs that position or, or uh, university professor, uh, as well as uh, you know, getting sign off from the from the consultant him or herself, so that you know we, you can be sure that you know everyone is above board. You're getting the rights you need, and that that is okay with the underlying institution. Right, and that's good. No, so um, consultants are very common, especially with a smaller startup kind of company. Uh, they have to start sort of as a virtual company. They have to bring in folks to help them out with certain aspects of their building their company and often are not employees. So um, I think we run into consultancy very frequently and there's a lot of standard issues there. Like, you know, what sort of, prior technology are they bringing to the to the to the company is this something that they own intellectual property rights in um and then going forward what is that what does that look like um do they does the company own the rights that come from any inventions with the consultant or not these are things you don't have to look at very carefully um and uh you know a, a little bit more here on retained rights uh sometimes they you know software you see that a lot where there's the um, underlying software is owned by the consultants or the consultancy and that it's only useful in a particular field or a narrow area and that um, maybe even improvements are um, assigned back to the consultants. So, um, you know, this this doesn't necessarily need to be a deal killer, but it is something to make sure that you really watch very carefully. And then going even, I would say, farther down the chain a little bit to vendors, um, the depending on the industry, the vendors can also be a source of an entanglement. Um, it's been a long time ago. Um, for me, but about 20 years ago in the stent cutting space, uh, there was a huge issue that resulted in an awful lot of litigation. Stents are little metal tubes that are used to prop open your blood vessels in your heart. And they are usually, there's a very fine pattern cut into the stent to allow it to expand and that's cut through a laser. Um, and in the beginning of the stent industry, this was done by only a few laser vendors who could actually do this sort of cutting. And there was one vendor who um, worked for almost every company. And I remember um, finding out from an engineer that they went to this company to, to get some stents cut. And it turned out that every other competitor's stents patterns was also on these machines. So there was this overlap that was concerning, but what really ha was even worse was that the um, laser cutter, uh, after having experience in doing all that cutting, became you know, fairly knowledgeable about the performance of stents and began to make recommendations to the different companies about how to improve their stent designs. And from that, then we're they were the vendor was filing patent applications on these designs the companies were finding pat, filing patent applications on the design and it became a horrible mess for everybody so something to watch very carefully i don't think that you know every, most vendors aren't necessarily in that space but if you have vendors who do provide potentially technical input to the to the development of the products it is something to watch very carefully Todd and Scott, I have one further uh, progression. A lot of what we talked about is like a company owning its own IP. Wondering if you have any suggestions for folks if their company is purely, you know, in license from a third party or there are particular things you're looking for, you know, in the license agreement. Todd, like if what they have with someone else, that might be a deal breaker or things they need to make sure in the license agreement from a third party that, you know, uh, would be problematic from an acquirer's perspective. Yeah, I think um, so. Typically, you know, from the big company perspective, one of the things that we do is we like to um, kind of close all the gaps or sweep it all in so that we can put it under the one big umbrella. And so you don't want any, uh, you know, obligations for supply. You don't want any ongoing royalties. You don't want any um, shared uh, marketing, you know, any of that sort of stuff. So, um, it's okay if they allow it. It's just if in the situations where it's required that it really becomes a problem, I think. And so uh, as a buyer, typically what we're looking for is the ability to take those relationships and essentially roll them up and put them all under the, you know, the corporate umbrella. Okay, why don't we go to the next slide? <clears throat> 
So this is this is the last issue on uh, that we'll talk about with respect to inventor entanglements, and this is the situation, kind of special situation of a founder inventor. So the med tech industry has really benefited from the contribution of serial entrepreneurs. Uh, I mean, there are there are a couple of names in the industry that have just done a phenomenal job at innovating and uh, coming up with uh, with really great products uh, that uh, have resulted in a number of companies being formed and sold and acquired. Um, but um, there are certain um, uh, things that you should look for or be you know, concerned with in the context of a, uh, uh, an M&A deal involving a founder inventor. I mean, th a lot of this is, is similar to the employee inventor issues we talked about earlier, but just on steroids. Rather than you investigate these things, if you see a flag, these are things that you just you're going to investigate because uh, there's a founder and mentor involved. So again, you look to the past. What were the previous companies, products, technologies that this particular inventor had been involved with? Um, you know, is there substantial overlap? In which case, you're going to want to look to the intellectual property of the previous companies. Um, and even if the products are different uh, in in a in a material way or if they are used in different, uh, you know, different clinical applications or used in you know, different bodily systems, you know, oftentimes there's a key uh, technology element that exists in the product that really makes it tick uh, that is common with the prior company, right? And you're just gonna wanna root that out and get to the bottom of it if you're on the buy side. Uh, so you can really understand, you know, what is it, you know, what are the, important technology elements of this product and whether that's in common with the previous company. And if so, do you have the necessary rights to practice? You know, is there, are there patents or other encumbrances on, on that IP that rest with the previous company? Um, taking that one step further, if what you're getting is an improvement, right, uh, to what existed before, you're right, this is the latest and greatest in this particular area, but it does represent an improvement uh, of what the uh, the inventor had previously come up with, you know, can you still practice those improvements uh, based on the IP that uh, pre-existed? So really, it's an FTO issue, uh, but there may be other aspects, as we talked about earlier, confidentiality and so forth, that that are somehow going to impact your ability to use that technology. And then, lastly, you know, Todd alluded to this, and I'll just I'll just um, uh, mention it again to reinforce the point. Many times what happens in this particular circumstance is that uh, an inventor may come up with um, a technology that is used or can be used in multiple clinical applications. And uh, will, it will embark on a licensing structure where you know, no, numerous companies are set up, each with their own licensing field of use for that technology. And, and that may be perfectly fine. That's worked uh, many times in the past, and we've seen lots of deals in which that's a perfectly effective way to go. But sometimes it's not effective. And again, Todd kind of alluded to this, but there are at least two circumstances that you know you might want to think about in particular that uh, we've seen time and time again. You know, the first is where uh, you you have a a product uh, that um, is sold. The, the fields of use are parsed so finely that you have the same customer for two or more fields of use, right? So the value of your of, of the license that you're acquiring is really undercut by the fact that someone else has a license that sold to this, you know, that allows them to, to sell the same product to the same customer and the customer doesn't care, right? I mean, again, this is something Todd alluded to earlier. The customer doesn't care, they're not gonna buy it from two different uh, companies just because one company has an exclusive field of use outside of the other. Uh, they already have the right to use it for whatever they want to do it for, and, they, and they're going to do that. Uh, the other circumstance is where you have truly a, um, a device that is truly usable across a broad platform of other devices. For example, let's say something like an electrosurgical uh, you know, power device, um, where it's not tied to a clinical application, and there's no FDA approval for a specific indication it's just usable for several different types of, let's say, ablation electrodes, right? Again, you know, the value for a license for that sort of product where you don't have to sell the product to the user specific to that field of use is really undercut by the fact that it can be sold for anything. And, you know, 
that's that is something we do see more often with, with in the case of founder inventors. Just as, as you look into the past, you also need to look into the future if you're on the buy side of this, because you know, uh, just because you you have now acquired the latest and greatest from this particular entrepreneur, uh, it doesn't mean it's going to be their last company. In fact, it probably won't be their last company. So what do you do about that? What do you do about the improvements to the technology that you just bought? Right. I mean, there are ways to deal with that. Uh, there are non-competes and confidentiality, as we as we talked about earlier. Uh, you know, it may be that what you really need to do is to tie up the uh, the inventor in some kind of time limited consultancy, uh, where during the period of consultancy, uh, you are entitled to uh, you know the the IP rights, where the, whether it be ownership or license rights to anything that uh, is reasonably useful for the practice of the technology that you bought in the first place. And that is usually an effective tool uh, to, to at least clear the path for some period of time, um, but not, not forever. So just you know, a point to just be concerned about in, in this particular case. Okay, so with that, why don't we turn to the next slide? And Lori, are you gonna talk about FTO? Great, thanks. So Scott and Todd have really talked about, you know, you needing to make sure that you actually own the IP that you think you own, um, and that is going to be going over to the acquiring company. Another big issue that I think a lot of people are probably familiar with is, okay, even if you do own that IP, can you use it to market a product? That is, do you have freedom to operate? Um, so basically needing to make sure that your patents and the claims of your patents don't infringe upon the valid patent claims of a third party's patents that actually claim the invention that you want to sell in the applicable jurisdiction. So, you know, it is a jurisdiction by jurisdiction analysis. It is based on, um, you know, the actual product. Uh, it can be a very detailed and specific analysis. And I think definitely if folks want to do a freedom to operate analysis or get more information about that, definitely want to contact a patent attorney to help with that because um, there's only so much you'll be able to do on your own uh, in interpreting claims and how high risk it is that you might be seen to, you know, infringe a third party's patent. Um, the purpose of the freedom to operate is really, uh, you know, an analysis that there's no patent lawsuits that are looming out there in the future that, you know, so an acquirer takes on the company and boom, they're going to get hit with a patent infringement suit, uh, which even if it doesn't go to trial, can be very costly just to start the negotiations, discovery, um, settlements, and things of that nature. So um, I think, it, it, and it's interesting in that, you know, the freedom to operate analysis can change over time, particularly if you're starting out with a really a prototype and an idea. And as you go along, you can definitely get ideas as to how to improve that prototype um, and to make it into more commercial product. So, you know, what your analysis at an early stage of development may not be the same as when you get to the actual product as to whether or not there's freedom to operate. So there's a need to think about it as you progress through the development process. Um, now, if there is a freedom to operate problem that's identified, um, there are ways to sort of deal with it, none of them without cost, of course. Um, one is you could purchase or license patent rights from the third party whose, you know, patent is found that you're found to be infringing. Um, you could also do cross licensing with them, you know, licensing some portion of your technology and they're giving you a license back. Of course, that takes time and money uh, and it's not going to be a simple, you know, easy solution um, if you find it out, you know, on the back end of some sort of process. Um, there's also the ability, if you find out about patents early on in the process that might infringe us to just design the product around the patent rights, which may or may not be permissible depending upon what, uh, what it is that you want to do. I think Scott was going to weigh in here too. Yeah, no, thank you, Lori. I just wanted to mention, you know, your point about the FTO process being kind of an evolutionary process is a, is a good one. And, you know, because um, the, the, the key here, especially for uh, emerging companies, early stage companies is you don't want to, um, you don't want to spend too many resources on, on doing an exhaustive, F, exhaustive FTO before it's really ripe. Right. So you want to, at the outset, um, you know, if you have in a perfect world, right, uh, what you'd want to do is at the outset, uh, do kind of a higher level uh, search, kind of a landscape search to understand what patents are out there in your space for, 
you know, a concept. You have a concept that's not yet, you don't have design freeze, uh, but you know the direction you're headed in. I think at that point, what you really want to know is, are there any, you know, big picture items, uh, fundamental patents in the space that are really going to be major obstacles that, you know, just cannot be overcome. And then um, that can usually be done uh, in a relatively, you know, cost-effective way. Uh, the, the harder one is as you near design freeze to really drill down in the specifics of the product and to do a detailed FTO if you can. You know, some companies don't have the resources to do that, but um, as I think you're going to talk about in the context of a, of a transaction, it certainly is makes it a lot easier if you if you've done that and have an answer for a potential acquiring company. Um, and but I guess my point is you don't need to get to that point until you're there, right? You still want to have some flexibility to make some minor design changes if you can do that to overcome what you find. Um, but, you know, not be so early in the process that you're wasting resources doing a freedom to operate analysis that may not be applicable because the product is likely to change by the time you move from concept to design freeze. Yeah, and if I could echo Lori's point on the change in time, um, you know, as the company gets bigger and the devices gets more complicated, I found it very common that the head of R&D or the owner of the company, the founder, doesn't actually understand every nuance of every device and or you know of every part of the device and um you know literally been sitting across the table from them and saying well this patent's a problem and they say well it doesn't because we don't operate that way and both of us looking at you know the engineer and saying well yeah it does now and so um, that was uncomfortable frankly for everybody right we didn't want it to be the case he didn't know that it was the case um so i mean it, it's a real issue and the the longer the design time is and the more complicated the device is the more likely that is to happen All right, next slide, please. So I think, what does this mean in terms of freedom to operate in the M&A context? Well, I think this is something I don't really see a lot of people doing, but I think they should, is there needs to be an understanding between the buyer and the seller as to what actually the seller has done. Have they done a full out freedom to operate or have they not? Because that can impact you know, the resulting documentation and deal in substantial ways. Um, if the buyer thinks they have done it, uh, you know, when the seller has not, there's going to be risk on the seller side from um, from having to basically, you know, give reps on something that they're not comfortable with and potentially be liable for a claim. But also the buyer wants to know because they could decide to do it on their own. And, and you know, they may have built it into their model that th they have freedom to operate. And without that, they're not going to be able to get the type of return they want. So I think being, you know, um, just sort of getting it out there and having an understanding as to what has to have been done. I think for early stage technology, um, it's highly unlikely, as Scott mentioned, that it's going to be cost effective to do a full out a freedom to operate analysis. It might just be easier to do a knockout search. And I think that a buyer who's sort of getting the early stage technology is going to be understanding of that and be willing to know that as the product progresses, they're going to put more money into doing more detailed searches and understanding uh, around the freedom to operate. Um, so in terms of how that impacts the definitive agreement, um, so, you know, one of the big things we spend a lot of time negotiating, and I can't tell you, is around the IP reps and warranties and whether or not the uh, rep around infringement is knowledge qualified or not. So, um, and I think that's because there's not a great understanding of what has been done in the background around freedom to operate. A lot of the clients that I represent are early stage and therefore have not done it. And so we're always saying it has to be knowledge qualified because we only know what we know um, and we haven't done it. Versus if you have done a freedom to operate, you're probably going to be asked to have a non-qualified rep, right? Because you've done the analysis and you should be able to give that assurance. Um, the indemnification package can somewhat help along these lines. I mean, for a buyer uh, in that, you know, they're going to be able to come back against the rep, whether it's knowledge qualified or not qualified, um, as to whether or not, you know, there is any mis anything misleading about the reps around infringement. However, um, you know, I think Todd will tell you there's times where the indemnification itself is not enough because, you know, you can only recover up to the purchase price that you paid to folks on absent fraud. And that's really hard to prove. So it might be that you've built out your model around this whole, you know, having this added to your um, product portfolio and you're going to lose a whole lot more than what you actually can get back in indemnification. So it's sort of a tricky interplay, but it is important, I think, for both sides of the transaction to understand where things are with respect to freedom to operate. Yeah, I would really echo that. To me, the biggest killer of deals 
is a surprise. And so this is one of those things that I think that you can do a lot of work on upfront to make sure that everybody has a common understanding of where you're going and what you're gonna do. So uh, avoiding that surprise, I think would make it more likely the deal will close. Um, and um, you know, if you if you really understand what your FT what you expect out of FTO, then that makes a that makes a huge difference. Yeah, and I think it's interesting too. Like people are like, when should we disclose? Uh, even in the early stage, people are like maybe subject to an opposition proceeding or interference proceeding, and they're not wanting to disclose that right away. And we're always like, you just need to get that out there, right? Because that's going to play into the analysis of the buyer, and the buyer is going to be grateful because they need to, you know, take a look at those proceedings and see how strong are they. Uh, do they think they actually can win those proceedings? So it's always good to be transparent in the process and not really hide the ball because if they find out about that last minute, it is not going to be a happy situation for anyone. Yeah, especially things like that that are public, right? The, the oppositions and, and that sort of thing we'll find it eventually. And when you do find it, then what do you think? Like, why didn't they tell us about this? Are they sloppy? Are they hiding something? Are they more worried than they, than they should be, you know, based on this? Um, so again, just the surprise is really what kills it, not the fact that that uh, opposition actually existed. Uh, we have we have a couple of questions around FTO, um, which let me let me see if we can uh, we can we can answer those real quick. Um, so one question goes to uh, vendors and the role of vendors with respect to both FTO and exclusivity. And I think the short answer to that is it depends on the role of the vendor. It depends on whether the vendor is kind of a, a really an extension of the company or whether the vendor itself um, owns the product, right? In other words, if the vendor is supplying is, is supplying a component of what you're selling, let's say, for example, they're supplying a component of a system that you're supplying. <clears throat> um, Usually, and you're not telling the, the vendor how to make that or its specifications, but it's really theirs. The exclusivity and FTO really comes from the vendor in that case, right? You're relying upon the intellectual property position of the vendor in that case. And uh, you're also relying upon uh, the vendor's representations and warranties and perhaps indemnification. It should be indemnification in that case. Uh, if there is an infringement exposure resulting from that vendor's contribution to your overall system. Right. Uh, conversely, if the vendor is just, you know, is an OEM for you uh, and you are supplying the specifications of the product, uh, so it's really your product, but they're doing a service for you relative to that product, then you would really own those things, right? It's your, it should be your IP. Uh, and you're relying on the exclusivity coming out of your IP and the FTO uh, position really rests, that obligation rests with you. Uh, and it's something that you would have to clear uh, re whether, it, you know, treating it as if it was your own product. Uh, Todd or Lori, I don't know if you have uh, uh, more input on that question. Uh, if not, we have another question, but any any other further thoughts on that? Uh, nothing to add for me. Okay. Another issue around FTO is um, what do you do about the privilege issue, right? And that's a, that's a great question, um, you know, uh, because what you don't want to do or, well, let me back up. It's not that you don't want to do it, but the risk I think you're talking about here is a privilege waiver uh, in the event that you uh, reveal um, attorney-client privilege communication in the, during diligence, and that's that's a legitimate concern. Uh, many times there there might be a common interest agreement in place, um, but you know that may or may not be effective. Um, I, you know I think de depending on the company, usually what I'll find is that. Uh, companies just do not exchange, they avoid exchanging privileged information. So how do you go about understanding FTO without exchanging privileged information? Uh, well, if, if for example, the, uh, the seller had done an FTO uh, review um, and they have a, you can get from them a sense of what they searched and what they found without getting into attorney-client privileged information. You don't have to have their non-infringement or invalidity position but you learn information through that process, factual information, not opinion information, uh, that you can then build upon. Uh, for example, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, please, uh, please provide to me key aspects of the technology that we can use to formulate our own opinion about non-infringement of you know, patents owned by such and such a company. 
Um, and then you can take that information. Uh, you know, of course, a lot of that information would be targeted so that you can specifically focus in on what the infringement issues might be. But that may be an effective way to avoid um, a, a, a waiver, uh, a, a privilege waiver. Um, similarly, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, hey, if there's any prior art that um, uh, that you have found over the, you know, in in the course of your investigation that may be relevant to our investigation, please provide, uh, you know, please provide us with the numbers of those uh, references so that we can take a look at those and do our own evaluation as to whether we think there's, uh, you know, a, an invalidity question. So those are just some examples of, of ways to get around it. But I agree, it is a, it is a very touchy uh, situation and an issue. And but there, are, you know, I found that there are ways to get around it. Todd, I don't know if, if there's a way that you've, you know, in the deals you've done, you, you tend to approach that, but that's how I tend to approach it. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Um, I don't, I wouldn't add anything to the, the part about how to get around it. Um, but the other is, again, just back to this, uh, you know, upfront understanding, um, you know, if the seller has said, you know, we're really worried about attorney client privilege, so we're not going to answer any questions, you know, then it's okay. But if you get into this, like, well, geez, we found this patent and, and we're wondering if you've done any prior art searching on this thing. And then they, then they, you know, give you the stiff arm, um, then I become much more nervous. And so, um, it, it's a tough issue for sure. Um, shared privilege doesn't really exist. So, um, you know, you try to work around it the best you can. But uh, again, with a good foundation up front, I think you can feel better about the transaction either way, frankly. I mean, if they say, we're not going to share any of our attorney client privilege with you. So do your own due diligence and make your own decision. Then, then we can do that. Or if they say, you know, we're going to work with you and uh, share, then, then that's fine too. Okay, why don't we uh, go to the next slide? I think, Scott, there's one other question about, oh, um, maybe you can answer this one about the cost of a high level search box. Yeah, I think that, so that's really, I mean, that's a hard question to answer because it really depends on the scope of the technology. Um, I mean, it could be, it depends on the scope of the technology and um, and what you find when you do the search, right? So you know apologies for being less than specific on this but it's it's you know i've seen it range from you know a couple thousand dollars to uh, several tens of thousands of dollars uh to do a uh to do a freedom to operate search obviously the higher the high level search where you're looking for a real fundamental patent in the space tends to be on the lower end of that spectrum but again it depends on it depends on the technology space um you know there is some areas that are just more well developed than others. Um, you know, if it's an older technology, you know, like 20 years plus old, uh, then then you know you may be able to rely on the fact that the fundamental patents are off patent and they're, they've expired. Uh, but if it's a technology in which there's still a lot of innovation happening, it can get it can get pretty expensive. So um, sorry to be non-specific, but that's about the best I can do on that one. Okay. All right, so just in terms of summary of recommendations, right? So uh, by side, as we go through this, uh, we want to identify the core IP for enhanced scrutiny around ownership. Also really to focus the issues. A lot of these diligence projects can be pretty involved and you're under a tight timeline. And uh, really one of the first things you want to do on this, on the buy side is, is get a sense of the core IP so that you can quickly focus your, your energy and resources. Uh, you don't want to investigate employment timelines for key inventors investigate non-employee IP assignment obligations to third parties, particularly if they're physicians, university professors, consultants. Um, you're going to have close scrutiny of deals involving serial entrepreneurs and multi-field licensing structures. That's just the nature of the game in this industry. Uh, and you're going to want to investigate FTO to your comfort level. You know, as, as Lori went through, there are deal terms that you can put in place to address uh, the freedom to operate exposure, but those at the end of the day may not make you whole. On the sell side, uh, you're going to want to think ahead, anticipate a lot of those questions, uh, condense your IP ownership into a single corporate entity if you can, understanding, of course, that that is a, a fairly involved decision and may have tax and other implications. Um, you're going to want to understand previous employment details for key inventors, uh, 
you know, even though you have these great inventors doing all this great stuff, you don't want to, you don't want to be taking in intellectual property that really belongs to someone else. Um, you're going to want to understand non-employee IP assignment obligations before the inventive activity, right? You're going to, those agreements we talked about and, uh, you know, the, the inventive activities that we're talking about, we're going to want to make sure that we have those um, agreements in place and that we're fully vetted on, on those assignment obligations before any of the new inventive activity takes place. Avoid open-ended physician feedback if possible um, without clear assignment obligation through a consulting agreement, uh, you know, a permissible assi assignment of obligation through a permissible consulting agreement. And then uh, last but not least, you're going to want to be clear about the FTO activities that have been undertaken, right? As Todd says, you know, the, the biggest, you know, what, what, what fouls most deals is surprise on the IP side. And you just want to be open and forthcoming about what's been done there. And I think that's I think that's it. Unless the other panelists, Todd, Lori, anything else to add to that? Nope. Nope, me either. I think that's a good summary. Unless anyone has any other questions, feel free to let us know. We'll just pause for a minute here and see if there's another question. No. Okay. I think then that's it, and we, we're going to turn this back over to Nicole. All right. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Lori and Tan. Appreciate your time and your expertise today. Thank you to Goodwin for sponsoring this webinar. Uh, we cannot provide this type of educational content without support from sponsors like you. So please consider that moving forward. Um, I encourage you to go to massmedic.com and check out all of the upcoming events that we have. Um, and as you can see here on the screen, um, they listed their contact information. So please feel free to reach out to them if you have any further questions. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you.